Okay, good morning, good afternoon, week three here. Um, one admin thing I wanted to, to share. Um, <clears throat> I saw Professor John sends out his weekly emails on the, on the program. And for this week, he had said that I was going to have office hours on Tuesday. That was the original plan. Um, I didn't, I, I wasn't able to actually get that set up on time for last, uh, this Tuesday that just passed two days ago. I am going to have office hours next Tuesday, February the 1st at uh, 4.30. Okay, so that'll, and, and now you should see that on the course calendar, and that should pop up on your, um, uh, on your Blackboard feed, okay? If you don't see it, then, then let me know, and, and it's the same Teams link that we're using now for the office hours, okay? I think that was the only update on Blackboard in module one, you would see that the week three um, presentation is there. That's the only uh, file that I've uploaded so far. We, today we are going to go over as practice questions the ones that were up there for week two. So we'll use those Excel sheets um, and questions as part of today's class. And I do just want to share with you uh, what's going to happen with the test. So actually, let me just fast forward a couple of slides here. It's more um, of a review week, but because everything is still brand new, it'll, I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of more than a, a review. We'll actually be doing some of the practice questions on those T accounts and reviewing the financial transactions. So <clears throat> we have this assignment one. This is test number one. So th I'm indicating that it's going to be open starting today. And this is how I do um, the two tests for this course. I'll, I'll open it up. Um, so you go into Blackboard under assignments. You'll see test one. It's not there now. It'll pop up at uh, 12 o'clock uh, Eastern time. Um, there's a time limit once you start the test. There's a time limit of three hours. So once you begin, uh, you go through all the questions. Within three hours, you hit submit, and then it's, it's submitted. That's your first attempt. If you wanted to retake the test, you go back to your notes. Uh, you you um, could actually come to the office hours next week. Then you could go back into the same test, start it again. The clock restarts, and as long as you complete it within that three hours, submit it, then I'll mark your final attempt. And as long as it's the final attempt is completed by uh, February 5th at midnight, midnight Eastern time. Okay, so you get multiple attempts. There is a time limit. And it's open resource, so you could use um, any of the class notes, uh, you know, the practice questions that we do. Uh, the way that the, the test is set up, there's a series of multiple choice. Then there's some short answer. And then I have two questions where there's an Excel file that you have to download the Excel file, populate your responses into the Excel, and then upload it back into the test. Okay, and the Excel files <clears throat> are going to look like what we're going to do today with the T accounts that we introduced uh, last week. Okay, so that's um, that's how the tests work. Any uh, comments or questions on on the test? I'm not sure if you have had um, any tests in any other classes yet. I don't think so. Professor, Professor, yeah. it says uh, the time limit is 300 minutes, so that's five hours. Uh, yeah, I, I round it up from three hours. Yeah. And, and I think it does give you a warning if you're about to hit that, that deadline, and then it gives you an even extra bit of time. So, um, yeah, it, it is more than the, than the posted uh, time limit. 
So you could see that already on on Blackboard. Oh, okay. yeah, it's there. Oh, maybe I put it to be released at noon yesterday. That's possible. Maybe I had the date wrong. OK. I didn't think it would be visible for you until until noon. So don't get started on it yet. <laughs> um, maybe till we get through through class. So my plan today is to finish up at around noon. So then you do have an hour and a half of class time if you wanted to get the first attempt uh, started. Uh, January 31st, the resource uh, assignment. Uh, I'm not sure what that resource assignment is. The, this, the other, <clears throat> the practice questions from week two don't have to be submitted if that's what uh, is being asked. So the professor, yep. the question like the sign-in says we need to submit like a uh, study one to three resource questions. Uh, by 31st. Which questions, sorry? Uh, short questions. You have uploaded with each of the studies each week. Um, so. Let me go flip over to. Uh, let me flip over to Blackboard real quick here and I'll. Just double check. So you could see my screen here. Um, in module one. So this introduction one that was to be submitted, this one here, that's just practice questions. That's what we took up last week. Um, recording these practice questions here do not, uh, again, are not did not need to be submitted. OK. The test is going to show up. Um, under tests and quizzes. This test one is what we're going to be doing. Uh, what would what, what open up? Sorry, I'm so sorry, Professor. <laughs> I messed up with another subject. Oh, Sorry. OK. All right. So that makes more sense. Sorry. OK, no problem. OK. Oh, all right. I see that in the chat. OK, very good. No problem. All right. So I didn't see any. Um, I had a few questions at the end of last class that clarified some of the the practice questions, what uh, the terminology was. I didn't see any other course messages, but I will still take the time today to go over um, the T accounts again, as I mentioned, as an example. So let's just get back to the uh, class presentation. Again, if you do see anything in the media, put it in the discussion board and I could respond uh, to it there. Uh, honestly, in the last week, I haven't seen a lot um, of, of press releases from the insurance company's perspective on the results. It's in the next few weeks, we'll probably see a lot more comments on um, the, Q, the year end results. Uh, there's been some high level stuff on um, total catastrophes um, in the industry. We saw that in intact uh, and we saw that from uh, CAT IQ. They have some industry uh, information, but I haven't seen a lot of other um, insurance companies with press releases in the past week. If there is any uh, 
ones that you see that you're interested in, whether you have a work placement with them or they're actually coming in to the uh, into one of your other classes as a guest speaker, then let me know or we'll talk about it at the start of class. Um, we can have a quick discussion on, on what we see as their financial results and what metrics they're using. Because then when that person comes in, then at least you're using the same terminology um, that that company uses. Because as I mentioned, there's a lot of uh, similar sounding terminology that's slightly different company to company, but it all meaning uh, relatively the same thing. So that's the kind of stuff we could review uh, beforehand. We're going to do a quick run through of the financial statements, but from last week, this is where you guys went into your small groups and then you fed back some of the answers on the financial statement. So again, I'm just going to highlight it and the key points I'm going to highlight are, uh, you know, the main takeaways. When you get into the test, you'll see some of the, some of those things being tested. And if it's repeated through the class and in the test, then it's likely you'll see it on the midterm. And the midterm really isn't that far away for this class. It's all on these first four weeks of work. So uh, this review today, the test, are all tee you up to help you get ready for the types of questions that you'll see on the midterm. And we're going to spend a lot of time most of today on the T accounts from uh, week two. So if you have that prepared on your own, um, you could get those ready um, to work through. I know the answers were provided, but I do want to work through the process of how to prepare it and what what you should be um, looking at. And then the test one does open up at uh, when we cut off class today, you could jump right into it. All right, I talked about the test. It's uh, even though it's open book and you have multiple attempts, it is still has to be uh, individually uh, completed on your own. OK. Um, <clears throat> we're here week three already. This is the assignment opens up now. Next week, uh, we continue on. But we just take one step further. And there's two more concepts that I introduce using the same uh, framework and building blocks of, of T accounts for insurance specific activity. That's earned premium and some more on claims. OK. So nothing brand brand new next week. It's an extension, but it's a unique type of transaction that we'll save for next week. And then Make sure we're all teeing up for this Feb, Feb 10th uh, midterm. OK, I'm going to go through this um, fairly quickly. I'm going to keep the chat open on the side. Um, again, because we did go through this last week. Um, if I go too fast, then just put something in the chat and I'll <clears throat> I'll try to pick it up or take yourself off mute. But I do just want to hit the highlights and then how it's all um, connected to when we how we do these T accounts and why we're presenting it this way. So keys for the for the balance sheet. I think you guys identified this quite well last time. Um, time period is key that it's as at a point in time. We have our assets, liabilities, and equity, and the accounting equation is our assets equal the total liabilities and equity. So these two parts of the balance sheet are, are unbalanced. <clears throat> so why is this key? And I keep coming back to this. So if we have our, there's our premium receivables. So when the insurance company binds a policy, so they, they make a sale to a broker, they're going to increase the receivable and the offset to keep this equation in balance is they're going to record uh, a written premium. So the written premium is an income statement account which is going to show up in retained earnings. Okay, so I have a separate slide that shows, you know, retained earnings includes net income for the period. <clears throat> so if we have a sale of $100, 
our assets go up 100 in this premium receivable and our retained earnings go up $100. As a separate transaction, when the broker pays the insurance company the premium that they collected from the policyholder, then the receivable goes down and then the cash goes up. So the, on that actual cash transaction, nothing happens in the income statement. It's just a shift between these two assets. And that's how I get another example of everything stays in balance. The receivable goes down. The broker doesn't owe us anymore once they paid us. And then the cash goes up because we have cash in the bank. Um, <clears throat> maybe just a quick one on the balance sheet again. If there is a, a claim that came in, we're going to set up a claim liability. This is our largest liability for the insurance company. So a claim comes in, the claim liability goes up. Again, this is before the cash happens. So we're increasing a liability. And then the offset is a claims expense. And we'll see that on the next slide on the income statement. But that's going to reduce the income. So retained earnings goes down when there's an expense. And then our liability goes up. So there's no change in the assets. Liabilities went up, equity went down, so that there's no change in the total liability plus equity, okay? Again, we're just shifting on this side of the balance sheet when there's a claim. So on the income statement, <clears throat> this is a activity over a period of time. We have our revenue and our expenses. Now this is all of the company's revenue and expenses. When we talk about just the underwriting result, again, we're just looking at a subset, the premiums and the claims and expenses. Okay. So that's what I have pulled out here. We have our underwriting revenues. Our sales is the written premium, revenues earned premium. They might have some other underwriting revenue. The main expenses are the claims expense, net claims incurred, and then the total underwriting expenses. Okay, so these amounts here, our revenue less these expenses is our underwriting result. This is like just the underwriting operations of the company. It's a subset of the total net income because this includes investment income and includes other financing expenses and income tax, okay? We I walked through this last week, <clears throat> this whole idea of the combined operating ratio, which is the ratio of claims over net premiums earned and expenses divided by net premiums earned. And this is how <clears throat> insurance companies measure their res per underwriting performance. The lower the number, the better. That means there's less um, expenses to cover for all the premium that they bring in. If the number goes over 100, then they've spent more money on claims and expenses than they did premium coming in. And it's the inverse of what a profit margin would be if it was an in a service company. Or in a service company, you might say, look, I made 797 based on this amount of sales. So I have a profit margin of 7.1. Insurance, we flip it around and say it's, you know, one minus the margin gives us this combined operating ratio. Okay, hopefully that part is, um, is you're starting to understand that relationship <clears throat> and how we calculate these ratios. The claims expense divided by net premiums earned, or underwriting expenses divided by net premiums earned. And remember those underwriting expenses in total for most insurance companies are made up generally of these three types of expenses. There's commissions. This is again, this is the commissions that the insurance company pays the brokers. 
if they're a direct writer where they don't use brokers and they just write directly to the policyholder, then they're not going to have any commissions okay, if they're a direct company. Then there's the general expenses. So these are the expenses that the insurance company incurs for its underwriting operations. Okay. It's salaries, it's rent, professional fees, audit fees, those types of things. And then there's a premium tax amount, and it's generally, you know, depending on the line of business, it's around 3%. And this is the company's expense um, that it pays for every dollar of premium that it writes. The provinces and some other federal regulators charge a tax. Okay, it's separate from the sales tax that a policyholder pays when they pay when they get invoiced for their premium. This is a company's expense. Okay. Any questions on combined operating ratio? Professor, sorry. Um, um in the example where the COR is 92.9. So what does it mean again if it's the higher the number, is it better for the company? Good question. Yeah. So the higher the number, this combined operating ratio is the worst for the company. The companies want a lower um, combined ratio because this is the sum of all of the expenses. So if the expenses are higher, then that means there's less profit and more expenses. Okay. Uh, I would think this is probably uh, the industry, actually, maybe 2021. This might be like the industry average. Um, I think it's definitely been coming down the last couple of years. Uh, but Maybe five years ago, most companies were reporting closer to 100. So with the rate, in, uh, what they call a hard market, and rate increases have been going up, there's been a reduction of the loss ratio over the last few years. Um, and that's been profitable for the insurance companies, so the combined ratios have been reducing. All right, I just, before we jump into the T accounts and getting into an example of how to um, interpret some of the questions that I gave last week and put them into the, um, the Excel sheet, I wanted to just go over this one more time as well. So um, when I, this is just a different way of looking at the balance sheet. And uh, so the, this is the balance sheet equation where assets equal liabilities and equity. So that first example I gave when there's a, a sale, uh, the insurance company binds a premium with a broker. We increase that asset for the broker receivable. And then we increased our revenue in the period, which increased net income. Net income's part of retained earnings. Retained earnings increased owner's equity. So when we talk about that sale, we'll do it on the T account, but we also want to um, understand what the impact is on the financial statement. So in that scenario, in this example, assets would go up and then owner's equity would go up, okay? Now, looking at the other items in owner's equity, contributed capital, I mean, we're not gonna talk about any financing that the insurance companies do. So we're not going to see any movement in contributed capital. Um, in retained earnings then, uh, it's the opening position. So that wouldn't change. There's going to be net income for the period, less any dividends that the insurance co company would pay out. So a dividend would, that it pays would decrease the amount of owner's equity. Um, and then our net income is made up of revenue minus expenses. So this is our premiums minus expenses, like our claims expense or our underwriting expenses. Okay, so here is, again, our T accounts. 
<clears throat> I'm going to jump over to Excel just to navigate uh, between the interpretation of these T accounts. Uh, what's key is that we break it down into individual transactions. I know the worksheet might get messy once you have all of the transactions in, but let's take our time and we'll go transaction by uh, transaction. All right, I might come back um, to this slide here. Really, this was just highlighting what I was talking about uh, when we had the balance sheet up. That's some of the key insurance specific accounts on this balance sheet. I know this this print is small, so I have the descriptions blown up here. Um, so our premium receivable. So this is the net premium that's due to the insurance company from the broker or the policyholder. Okay, there could be an account for broker receivables and a separate one for policyholder receivable. And it's net amount because it's net of the commissions that the insurance company owes back to the to the broker. OK, so the way that it works, if there is a broker, say Marsh. Marsh would collect the premium from the policyholder. So Marsh now has the, the, the cash. The insurance company is going to collect the premium from Marsh, but then pay Marsh their 20% commission. So the receivable that the insurance company has is for the original premium, less what the insurance company is gonna pay back to the broker as their commission, okay? Is there a, a question right now? I see that someone's got their hand up. Uh, yes, Professor mm -hmm. Jason. This is Dichen here. Sure. Professor, can you please explain again? I mean, I'm sorry about the. Uh, I'm I'm a, I'm a little lost here. I'm not able to actually really grasp what's really happening in this regard. Mm -hmm. In terms of the COR, as well as uh, you said, like the broker was going to get about twenty percent commission. So the company is going to pay premium against the eighty percent, or is it going to be for the whole hundred percent? Okay. These are two questions, by the way. Sorry. Yeah. No, I, I got it. Yep. Yeah. Okay, no, very good. I'm going to break both of those down. In a second, I'm gonna open up a, an Excel file and then work through those um, those examples specifically, okay? Okay, Professor, thank you. All right. uh, let me just see if there's anything else um, here to show. On the claims, uh, liabilities, these are the gross claim reserves that the insurance company is going to be paying out to claimants, okay? Uh, and then we talk about UPR and reinsurance a little bit next week. All right, so. Uh, I might come back to these uh, further descriptions on the as accounts um, afterwards, but we'll probably cover this in our examples in Excel. All right, so give me a second just to pull up the uh, Excel file that we're going to be working through. All right, which one? Did, let me see. I had one open. <clears throat> All right, I have a different examples ready, but let me go over the file. Um, I'm gonna open up my COR um, example. Just give me one more second. Hopefully I could find it here. All right, good. Yep, sometimes I get this question and sometimes I don't. So this is a, a common question uh, about the combined ratio. So let me just share um, the Excel sheet here.
OK, so hopefully you could see this sheet sheet now, right? <clears throat> oh boy, what did I do? OK. So this this is a different um, set of examples, but it'll go through the math of this combined operating ratio. OK, let me just find uh, a nice clean one. <clears throat> All right, so. Here's our example that we're going to use. All right, here we go. So we have some financial results from the insurance company. OK, so we have. Uh, I just show the written premium and the earned premium. <clears throat> just to get you used to the fact that what we use as a ratio, what's the um, the measure for revenue for the insurance companies is this net premiums earned. OK, so we use the revenue number as the baseline to see how much of this revenue is used to pay for uh, claims, how much is used to pay for expenses. Okay? So we have this net premiums earned number of 2,501, okay? <clears throat> the amount that the insurance company, um, again, this is maybe too much, but it goes into the matching principle. So we have revenue of this much. The insurance company, using its best estimate, thinks it's going to have this much of a claims expense. All right, now some of, I say this as an estimate because these claims aren't known at the time. Some might be known and paid, and some are going to be known in five years, 10 years, but it's still all related to this revenue. So the insurance company has to make an estimate of its claims, and it records that in the same year, in the same period, um, as net claims incurred. Okay. And later in the, in the course, we go through all the details of what types of claims expenses are net claims incurred. And the reason we really break this one down is when we go into the um, press releases and the way the insurance companies measure their results, they really break down all the, the details of what's in their claims expense. One, because it's the biggest uh, expense that we have, but it also drives their underwriting and their strategy. Okay. So, we start first with what the loss ratio is or claims ratio. So I'm going to call this the loss ratio. Just the math on this is it's going to be our, uh, our claims incurred divided by our net premiums earned, okay? And that's a percentage. Now, the expense is shown here as negative, but we always just show the ratios as a positive ratio, okay? So this is, as a, if there was a $1 of premium, 70 cents, 70.1 cents, would be used to pay out the claims, okay? So that's the loss ratio. That's the amount of premium dollars that the insurance company is going to pay out in claims. And then we look at the expense ratio. Okay, so <clears throat> same idea. We look at the total amount of net expenses. And I just said net expenses because there's a small amount of other underwriting revenues. 
don't get confused by by this. What in any of the examples that I give, it, I'm always going to give you the net um, underwriting expense number. Now remember, this includes commissions, underwriting expenses, um, and taxes. Uh, underwriting expenses, yeah. <clears throat> so it includes commissions, general expenses, and premium tax. So same idea with this ratio for the losses. The expense ratio is going to be our uh, net uh, underwriting expenses divided by our sales number, or sorry, our revenue number, our net premiums earned. Okay. Well, for every one dollar or a hundred dollars of premium that comes in. $30.20 would be paid out on expenses. Okay, so this is a total amount of expenses that um, have been paid out. So if we add our loss ratio, oh, where are you going? We add our loss ratio plus our expense ratio, we're going to come up with the combined. Okay. All right, so we added these two ratios together to get this. So this is an interesting example because now we're over 100, which means that we would have had this eight, the little minus sign was on the side, so just change the formatting. We had an underwriting loss of eight, which makes sense that we had a loss because the combined ratio is over 100. Okay, 100 is the break-even point. If the underwriting results were zero, that meant all of the premium that we collected was paid out to either claims and expenses. Okay. If we had less losses, Okay, so instead of 1700, we have 1200. The loss ratio would have decreased from 70 to 50, and the combined ratio decreased from 100 to 80. And instead of an underwriting <clears throat> loss, we have underwriting profit. Okay. Back to the way <clears throat> that the example was. Okay, does that help with the combined operating uh, ratio? Okay. Uh, Hi, Professor uh, Ankit here. I have a question. So, uh, the difference between the direct uh, premiums written and the net premiums written, so what all uh, component does it include? Yep, okay. <clears throat> so the difference between direct premiums written and net premiums earned, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I will, actually that's right on uh, our slides. So let me um, jump back over to slide presentation here because actually that was the next uh, slide that was up. So we have this and again good question because I'm intentionally showing you these two not not to trick you but to make it uh, to highlight the fact that they are different. Uh, direct premiums written are the sales numbers to the policyholder, whether it's to a broker or directly to the policyholder. <clears throat> what the difference is when we get to these terms direct and net is that they are um, some other types of transactions that we get into later, but we could introduce them now. Um, this direct to net means there's also some assumed premiums sometimes. So this is when the insurance company makes a premium sale 
not to a policyholder, but to a reinsurer. Okay, so that's incoming premium to the insurance company, but it's not from a policyholder, it's coming from another <clears throat> insurance company. And then we have this term gross, which is the sum of direct plus assumed. So this is <clears throat> incoming sales to the insurance company. Then we deduct an amount for seated premiums written. And this is when the insurance company um, reduces its premium, it transfers its premium out of the company to a reinsurer. Okay, so gross is coming in, seated is going out, and then we get this net uh, premium as a result. Gross less seated. Okay. Professor, what is assumed mm -hmm. in, under gross premiums written? Uh, what is assumed? <clears throat> yeah, well, when we get into reinsurance, we could uh, go into it a bit more detail. But <clears throat> what it is, is when the insurance company has um, a contract with another insurance company called the reinsurer. So instead of us issuing a, a policy like you would to a policyholder, we're actually uh, issuing a contract to an, another insurance company to bring in premiums, okay? So it's a different type of, uh, of contract, but it's part of the gross uh, premiums. When we look at different types of uh, either seated contracts, then it has, uh, it's related to the assumed premiums too. Okay, so we'll go through these two types of transactions, um, uh, I believe after the midterm. But the important part is it's the net, means it's um, direct premium, plus assumed is your gross, less the seeded is your net premiums written. And just the acronyms that we use for the written premiums, so it's either DWP for direct written premium, uh, seeded written premium, and net written premium, NWP. And I just highlight this, some insurance companies flip the P and the W, the last two characters, and they might use the acronym NPW versus NWP. What's important is not the order, but it, that it's net, N for net, and W for written, okay? As opposed to, if it's an E, net premiums earned would be NEP, or N E, sorry, NPE, okay? So what we had so far is how did we get from direct written to net written, but we want to get to net earned premium, okay? So the difference between written and earned is that, um, so this is describing it as it's the non-refundable amount of the premium. Uh, another, a better way to think about it is the insurance company is going to earn the premium over the whole term of the policy. So if it has a, a one year policy, which is typical, then we start off with zero, earn a premium, and then over the life of the policy, the earn premium in increases. Uh, you know, some people compare it to like a magazine subscription, even though you buy a one year subscription, but every month, you get that magazine. So that's one month of the earned premium coming in that the insurance company is allowed to record as its revenue, okay? So I have some illustrations next week um, to go into this idea of earned premium over the monthly, over the term of the policy, okay? So when we look at sales, direct premiums written, so this is direct versus net premiums earned as a revenue. 
This net means it's net of any seeded activity and it's earned, meaning this is how much of the policy terms have already expired versus the written amount, which is the 100% of the sales. So those are some complicated uh, terms there. But that's why we keep repeating it and diving into it in, in pieces, because this is uh, this is complicated. So I, and I understand that and we'll go into more examples of the earned premium uh, next week. Is that uh, good for now for um, the combined operating ratio question and this net written to earned? And to, to Shen, I, I forget, I think I'm going to go into the T accounts, which was your second uh, question. Uh, yes, Professor, it was Dichen, um, Dichen here. Yeah. It, it was how to do, do the, the, the T accounts, right? Okay, so we're going to get into that uh, right now. Mm -hmm. Okay. Just getting my other uh, the worksheet ready. Okay. Uh, right. Sorry, Professor. Before we get into the T accounts, mm -hmm. uh, what I what I wanted to understand was the figures that were being reflected that time. Are those like? fictional figures or is it like of some company's figure? How, just trying to understand actually. The examples uh, in here? Yes, yes, Professor. These, yeah, these, um, this, is a, this is actual intact Q Q2 2019. All oh, right, right. So this is in reference to intact insurance Okay. Yeah. What right. what I show in the slide decks that we use would be more current numbers uh, for the full year. So I would add the full year 2020 um, in the example, but the math here to get the ratios is the same regardless of what the actual dollars amount are. All right. All right. Okay. All right. So for Let's see what we'll use as the work as the example here. Let's go through um, the the second set of questions, and again, I'll just pull these up so everyone knows where they are coming from. Week two questions uh, for the breakout group in this item on Blackboard. Uh, that's not it. Maybe it was in here. Okay. So this is the Excel sheet that I have downloaded. Um, week two assessment for input. Let's go through the uh, assessment three handout. Okay. So what we want to do is understand when there's these types of activity within the insurance company, we want to understand what the impact is on the financial statements. And to do that, we first look at the transactions in the T accounts so we can see that dual entry and then we'll could then understand what the impact is on both the balance sheet and the income statement. OK, so that's why we take, use these as um, sample examples of transactions. Create the T account as our first building block. And then we look at 
how does it impact the financial statements, okay? As far as what assets going up, uh, what's the offset to make sure that our balance sheet stays in balance. When there's an increase in expenses, what's the offset? How does that have an impact on our, the rest of our financial statements, okay? Because we can't just have one account being impacted. There's always uh, a balance. So that's why we go through these as, as an example. And then we could also go through some of the, the terminology uh, here as well. So when we talk about binding a policy, that means uh, the contract, the insurance contract was agreed upon, it was bound. So that means there was uh, a sale, okay? So we're gonna do, again, just in one small building block, uh, dual entry, so it's just two items at a, at a time. Um, Binding the policies for $12,000. There's no cash that's come in. And we're going to assume that this is uh, the insurance company's perspective that they sold the policy through a broker. Okay, and I'm just going to put in a couple blank columns here. Okay, so we had 12,000 binding a policy. And the, our other tool that we use is our workbook, okay? So I'll download that just so it's, that it's handy as well. And again, I'm just showing you on Blackboard, so hopefully you're comfortable where all these things are. I'm just scrolling through. To our little um, cheat sheet here. So we have a revenue because that's our premium sale. Again, doing that first T account, we bound a policy for 12,000. So so that's going to be our written premium. And we want to increase our written premium. So a plus sign in this chart means it's increasing. So I'm going to put a, an entry in the T account on the right hand side. Okay. Written premium. This is our revenue account. Not trademark. And I'm going to put a little footnote that this is transaction number one. Oh. All right. So again, we put in this transaction so we could go back and identify that we have a, a right hand side for transaction one. Now we need a left hand side. So we made a sale. And we that means we're going to have to be we're going to collect cash from the broker at some later date. It's money that the that the broker owes us. Okay, when we make a bind a policy. Now, if you want to use Excel to make sure you're always in balance, you could do if I have I just did the formula here so it's linked. So we increased written premium 12,000 and I increased the broker receivable 12,000. And I say I increased the broker receivable because that's an asset and I increased it with an entry on the left hand side. Broker receivable is an asset account. Okay. And again, to keep track, this is my transaction one. I put a little one indicator there. Okay. So that is the response for binding policies for 12,000, okay? So hopefully that, um, you're starting to see how that works. Um, some of the accounts, I mean, 
people. The written premium, that's a key account, that that's a revenue account um, for when the company is making a sale. Okay. If you knew that there had to be an increase in an asset and you weren't sure what the asset account was, some of these ones we're going to keep using over and over. But in the, um, you know, in the, in the balance sheet, if we look at accounts that we have available, one, I'm always going to have it on the chart for you to, to populate the answer. So you'll see that there's a, a account with that name on the T. But also in the balance sheet, we'll see we have this premium receivable account. So this is our, um, whether it's a receivable from a policyholder or receivable from a broker, both of those are assets. And here we have it labeled as a broker receivable, okay? The second transaction was, there's going to be a commission. Professor, sorry, yep. yeah, um, regarding that first item. So broker receivable is um, the broker will remit the premiums to the insurance company. Is it that's why it's a receivable? Correct. Right. right. Again, all of these transactions are from the viewpoint of the insurance company, not, uh, not the broker. <clears throat> okay, so the second one is we're going to pay some of this uh, uh, we're going to pay the broker a commission for them binding this this policy. Okay, this is a small uh, commission in, in this example, but the dollar amounts given, and then this is the insurance company setting up the payable to the broker. So I'm giving you one side of the transaction here that we're setting up a payable to the broker, but it's for a commission. So the insurance company has a commission expense. So commission is an expense account. And, you know, one, if this is revenue on the right-hand side, expense is going to be the opposite. It's going to be left-hand side. Or you could come back to our, have this open. And our expenses to increase expenses, it's a debit, the left-hand side. So commission. This is going to be transaction two. So we have our left-hand side entry, so we need our balanced entry on the right-hand side. We're going to read use the same broker receivable account because this account is the premiums that they owe us less net of the commissions that we owe them. And again, don't forget, put in your little reference to keep track. Because now I could see, okay, transaction two, left-hand side, right-hand side, we're balanced, all right? So there's a broker payment. Now, even though this says map the July activity, um, let's do this item three as if the cash was received in July, okay? The broker payment says it's due in August. Usually the broker would pay a month later. But just so I can illustrate what happens when the cash comes in, let's do this 1160 right now. So we have a, a cash asset. So anytime something is paid or the insurance company makes a payment or receives a payment, that term payment means we're going to go through the, the cash account. Okay, so the insurance company received the cash, which means it increased it, this asset. That was the right number, right? <clears throat> 11760. This will be 
So if this cash asset went up, what happened on the cash is we're now reducing what the broker owes us, okay? Because now after they pay us, they don't owe us any longer. So we're going to reduce that receivable from the broker. Reducing that receivable is the right-hand side. The same 1160, okay? So we increase this asset and decreased that asset in this example, okay? So I'm trying to use the same terminology that um, we used when we were looking at this chart, right? So that cash one, we decreased an asset and increased a different asset. So assets went up, assets went down, net zero, nothing else changed on the cash. For the commission, the assets uh, decreased because we owe the broker less and the expenses increased. The expenses increasing, reduced income, reduced retained earnings, reduced equity. So we had decrease in equity from the commission expense and we decrease the asset because the broker owes us less. And then the first one was the premiums where the assets went up for the receivable and the revenue went up for the written premium. The revenue went up, net income went up, retained earnings went up, so shareholders' equity went up, assets went up, okay? So I'm just trying to tie everything back to what is gonna change on this balance sheet when there are those three transactions that we just talked about. Let me, um, let's just look at, again, just these three transactions. So here is the sample balance sheet um, before the transactions, okay? We have our assets. We have our liabilities, our equity, and total, okay? So total liabilities, here's the breakdown of all the equity accounts and total assets, sorry, total liabilities, shareholders equity, 25359 is the same as our total assets. So what happened in transaction number one? We had our premium receivables went up 12,000 and our revenue went up 12,000. <clears throat> there was no change in our liabilities. Our assets went up 12,000, okay? So that was transaction number one. Number two. Number two said we paid the broker we're going to pay the broker 240. So we decreased our asset by 240. We decreased our income by 240. Okay, no change in liabilities. All right. The last one said the cash came in of 11,760, and then this decreased 11,760.
So there is no change in the asset and there's no change in any other account for the cash. Okay. So if we wanted to see what the impact was on our balance sheet after those three transactions, we could say we started with the 30, but we ended up with started with 30. So our as our cash asset increased to 41. Our premium receivable started at 45. It went up and it came down for the commission. Then it came down because the cash came in. So we had no change in our premium receivables after those three transactions. So our assets, what is happening here? Okay, so here's what our new balance sheet, our assets look like after we put through those three transactions. But we still have to be in balance, of course. So our liabilities in these examples haven't changed. but our equity did change. So I'm just adding our opening plus this activity that we had. So now we let's just do a check that our total assets, 325, 371, 25, 371, 260 is the same. Our assets still equal our liabilities. So that's a lot of steps to go through, but I think it's it's the right building blocks to understand when we have, again, we just did the first three transactions, what the impact is on, on the accounts. And we I just took it through to the impact on the balance sheet. Okay. So we did these T accounts, written premium, commission, broker receivable, and cash. And then further took it through, here's what the impact is on the balance sheet, okay? Step by step by step. We'll go through some more of these um, different T account transactions. But let's take a uh, let's take a five minute break. Hopefully that's long enough. We'll come back in five minutes and then go through some of these other ones. If you got through them or tried to go through them and have some specific questions, then bring those up too as I go along. Okay. But let's take a let's take a five minute break here.
Okay, welcome back. So <clears throat> I was uh, maybe had good intentions that we'll be able to wrap up by by noon uh, Eastern time, and then you could get into uh, starting your first attempt at the test for those of you that are comfortable to do so. Um, but I'm going to go through some more examples. So maybe we are about another um, a half an hour to go. Um, and and I'll mention it now that you know we have uh, I have the office hours next week, um, four thirty to five thirty on Tuesday. That's Eastern time, of course. Um, and we'll go through bring your questions, and we'll go through more different types of examples um, and dive into what pairs of accounts work together with each of these types of transactions, and maybe we'll come up with some different ones um, as well. And I say a pairs of accounts because really the learning objective is to reinforce that I understand, yeah, there's a dual entry. There's debit and credit, left side, right side of the T accounts. They work uh, together to make sure that my balance sheet equation of assets equal liability plus owner's equity always stays in balance. Okay, so this is... <clears throat> really the objective of, of all of these things and then using insurance specific examples to reinforce that okay so i'm going to go through uh, a, a few more of these if there's any specific ones uh, let me know some of them are more complicated that uh, if you did have some accounting background then it'll probably come it will come quickly to you um, if you if you don't, I'm just going to go through the more basic ones today as an easier building block. OK, so. Um, some of the cues. Uh, say for item number four here, and, and I mentioned it before, if something is paid. And this is the insurance company making a payment. Then right away, you know, one half of the dual entry is to cash. Okay, whenever we say a payment is made or something is settled um, or there's a receipt, you know, that those are all indications that we're going to have a change to the cash account uh, on the balance sheet, that asset account cash. So, all right, so here we go. Rent uh, paid first of the month, $5,000. So right away, let's hit cash, increased cash. 5,000 and item number four. Okay, so without knowing any accounting, you think you've changed cash. Oh, sorry, my mistake already. Cash went out. We didn't receive the rent. We paid rent. So we decreased cash by 5,000. Okay, decrease in that asset is a credit right hand side again if we use our guide here i'll keep I'll, I'll stop flipping back and just keep this open now decreased cash asset <clears throat> so there is uh the, the fact that we paid it it's a monthly payment it's uh, an expense, so we're going to increase our rent expense. Increase an expense with a left-hand side entry, a debit. It's also, this is the right-hand side to cash. I need left-hand side to rent. Question four. Okay, so there's how we record rent expense. Okay, so we're we're balanced left, <clears throat> right hand side, left hand side. Uh, the salary expense would work the same way. Salary is paid, so we're recording our decrease in cash, and we're offsetting it by an account salary expense. All of these rent expense, salary expense, all these are part of general expenses that we saw on the income 
statement, which is all part of our uh, underwriting expenses. Okay. I wanted to jump into uh, these claim ones. All right, so claims are the largest expense for the insurance company. So one, I'll just go over some of the terminology uh, here. And then we really break down the claims transactions into individual small components of, of, of how the, what's going on with the claims. Okay. So let's just read number nine and 10 here. A claim notice is received and processed for 5,000. <clears> so this means that uh, a claim happened somewhere. Uh, the claimant, either through the broker or directly to the insurance company, um, advises the insurance company that there's a claim. So the claim adjuster receives this notice and confirms that it's uh, you know a valid claim, and we process the claim liability for five thousand. So it doesn't say we're making a payment but we're just setting up that first claim reserve. Okay, so that's the first one. We're gonna set up our claim expense and create a claim liability, something that the insurance company will be paying out in the future. Okay, number 10, now we're saying there is a payment is made. You notice it's a different amount. We originally thought the claim was going to be for 5,000, but then by the time the adjuster reviews the file, makes the final payment, the claim payment is something more. So we paid out uh, 5,500, and then we're saying that the claim is closed. So just because we made a payment, doesn't mean the claim file is closed. There could be additional payments to make like a payment to um, a third party adjuster, a payment to a lawyer, um, a payment to um, maybe they have to pay the auto body as well as paying um, some medical expenses, right? There could be multiple payments on a claim. But when we say the claim is closed, that means we're putting the claim liability to zero. Right, we're saying there's no, we don't believe there's any more payments to be made on this claim. All right, so we're going to go through these two, um, nine and ten, right now in in detail. Uh, yeah, so hopefully I'm 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 going. Uh, if this is still too fast, we're gonna break it down again uh, during the office hours in addition to what we go through today. So we're gonna take these claim steps um, nice and slow, step by step. All right, so here is just catching up on, on the chat here. So for the claims, we have claim liability. And if you remember on the balance sheet, claims liability is the largest liability. This is the one that's listed first on the balance sheet. Okay, claims liabilities. This is the largest liability. So this is the amount of claims that the insurance company expects it will have to pay at some point in the future. And the largest expense is our net claims incurred. All right, so those are our Two accounts that we see on this is income statement, net claims incurred, 
And on the balance sheet, we have our claims liabilities. So claims liabilities, I tell you this is a liability, this is a liability account. And our net claims incurred, we saw that on the income statement, so that's an expense account, oh, not a euro. And then the other account we're gonna use is our cash account, which we already started using um, when there's actually the payment, okay? So the first transaction, number nine, was the notices received and processed for 5,000. So again, in that scenario, there was a claim. The claim report got to the insurance company's claim adjuster. They reviewed it. They says, okay, yes, I agree. Uh, this is one of our policies. The claim happened. We're gonna set up a liability for 5,000. All right, that's setting up the claim reserve for $5,000. The insurance company believes that we'll make this payment. <clears throat> so we're going to set up the claim liability, set up the liability, we increase it, increase the liability is on the right hand side. You could go back to the workbook to see that. So we're going to increase 5,000. This is number number nine. Now, when we set up the claim liability, we're always going to have um, a net claims incurred is the expense. These two accounts will always work uh, in pairs. Whenever there's a change in our net claims liability, we're going to have an expense in net claims incurred. Okay. So this is a pair of accounts for item number nine that work in tandem. Claims liability and net claims incurred. The second transaction, number 10, said there was a payment for 5,500, right? That was item number 10. So again, whenever there's a payment, we know it's something that's impacting cash. So we reduced our cash by 5,500. Okay. And whenever there's uh, the cash, we're actually going to record this expense. So this 5,000, example four, paid cash, it was rent expense. This 5,500 for the claim, this is number 10. Is a uh, claims expense. So those two are going in tandem as well, okay? And the last bit of number 10 says we closed the claim reserve, right? We reduced the claim liability to zero. So we originally had a claim liability of 5,000. Now we're saying we settled the claim and we closed it. So that means we don't want there to be any more liability because we, we think that we're going to be paying uh, zero more dollars going forward. Claim is closed. So we have to reduce the amount of claim liability that we have. We had 5,000, so we're going to reduce it by 5,000. We'll call that 10B because that's the second part is actually closing the claim. <clears throat> and like I said before, whenever there's a change in the claims liability, you're going to have the offset in net claims incurred. So this was left hand side, right hand side, 5,000. And this is the B part. Okay. 
All right, so those two, that is our dual entry for the claims liabilities and net claims incurred. All right, I'll pause there. And again, yeah, if you want to make um, make your own notes, you also have, I mean, the complete answers are also here on the next page if you want to step through it step by step. So there's the 10B. Oh, not that big. Ten B, ten B here that I just did. Okay. But the important thing is that we're going to take these claim ones step by step. We're identifying which pairs of accounts work for each type of transaction. And as you work through these examples on your own, you'll get more familiar with which accounts we're using. Uh, as we get used as well to the terminology for the types of claim uh, insurance activity uh, that we'll see repeated and repeated, okay? So the claim notice is received. We increased uh, the claim liability and recorded a claim expense. When we make the payment, we reduce cash, we record the claim expense, and then we close the claim, which means we reduce the liability and we do reduce the claim expense. Okay, so those are the three transactions that always work together whenever there's a claim. I'm just going to double check on the other chat messages coming in, but let me know if there's any um, specific questions on the claims. So I have some more examples here <clears throat> where we could break through all the different types of claim scenarios. Um, as opposed to just these ones uh, here in nine and 10. Claims are the most, uh, I know they're more the complicated transaction because there's so many different types of scenarios of what could happen with claims, but they're complex, but it's also important to understand because it is our largest liability. It is our largest expense. All right, so I'll go through a few more um, claim examples. So what I, I have on this worksheet, <clears throat> and, and this is also in the file that um, I have up on, on Blackboard. What I'm gonna do is just go row by row and then unhide the amounts. Um, if you wanted to see them in your own worksheet, you could just make everything uh, in black, the lettering. Uh, I have some of the font in white, just so I could hide them until we get to them. So what happens with, with the claim uh, transaction? So the first thing that happens when there is a claim is the company, we're gonna say the uh, insurance company receives a new claim notice. So we get a notice that a claim's come in. So we have, we're gonna record that expense right away. 
Okay, so we record the expense. Net claims incurred is our expense account. We're increasing that expense with a debit. And we also set up the claim liability. So this is something that the insurance company is going to be paying out. The company owes to somebody, but that's a trigger. This is going to be on the balance sheet and it's our claims liability account that we're going to increase. All right, so this is a $4,000. The dollar amount is, is just random for this example, but it's the two buckets that we're talking about here, right? Setting up a claim liability, setting up a claim expense. That's the first thing that happens when the claim notice comes in. So the second thing that might happen is that there's an ex claim, some type of payment is made on that claim. Okay. And it doesn't have to be a full payment to close the claim. Um, <clears throat> it could be a claims expense to pay for a third party adjuster who's going to review it. It could be to the mechanic who gave an estimate. Uh, it could be to a lawyer who's going to represent the company for a liability claim, a a any type of scenario. Okay. So when we have a claim expense payment, First thing that you know, if it's a payment, we're going to reduce our cash. Okay, in this case, it's for the full 4,000. And whenever we have a claim payment, we're going to also increase our expenses to the claim, uh, net claims incurred for that claim payment. As a separate transaction, we're going to reduce claims liabilities. And if we don't think there's going to be any more payments on a claim, we want to reduce the liability. So to reduce the liability, we increase it with the credit right hand side. We're going to decrease the liability on the left hand side. Whenever there's a change in our net claims liabilities, uh, the offset, the dual entry is always going to be net claims incurred. Okay. Those two will all, whenever there's a change here, there's going to be a net claims incurred. It doesn't work vice versa, because in this case, we had a net claims incurred and the offset was cash. But whenever the there is a, a activity in claims liability, we're always going to be matching it with the net claims incurred amount. That would be a good note to make as a as a reminder. <clears throat> there could be a, a scenario where Let's go with number three here. We're going to receive a new claim notice. This client is 7,000. Again, it's a random example. It could be that we receive the notice, but then we're going to close the claim with no payment. So the scenario where this might be um, the case that the claimant submitted a claim and then after the claim adjuster reviewed it, they could say, okay, we don't, this isn't our policy or is outside the terms, it was outside the coverage, something like that. So we, the insurance company could say, look, we, we set up this liability, but we're going to decrease it at some later date. Actually, this is a different example than I originally had, but let's just continue on with this close the claim with no payment um, example. Okay.
All right, so we close the claim with no payment. That is another scenario where we set up the liability one transaction and then we decreased it in another transaction. This is the terminology we'd use. Close a, close a claim with no payment. All right, so we could have other types of uh, transactions. Let me see here. Let's do another a new one. We're going to receive another transaction. Let's say we had 10,000. $10,000 claim came in. Okay, new claim. And then we could make a claim payment to expenses. So it's on this same claim number five. You could say we paid claim expense. Uh, professor, do we also yep. add the reserves, the claim reserves that we receive from the client on the losses that are not yet to be paid, but we need to reserve a certain amount for that loss? Um, in this example here, number five? No, to the entire sheet, if we have to add that item or not. The claims like... The claims liabilities in total? Yes. Um, the, I, I'm not sure I, I follow the question. It would be the total of all of these transactions would then be the net impact on, on the balance sheet after all the ins and outs that happen uh, through claims liabilities. Okay. Let me just do a couple more um, examples here. Okay. So when we made this $9,000 payment, we want to reduce the amount that we think is going to be paid on this claim because we thought we we're going to pay 10,000. We paid 9, so we want to reduce our reserve, our claim liability by the 9,000 because we made a payment already on it. Then as a separate transaction, they, another month goes by, the claim adjuster could say, okay, I think that there's no further payments to be made. We wanna close the claim. So we wanna bring the claim liability down to zero, close the claim. That means we bring the liability zero and right now the liability on this claim number five we started with 10 decreased it by nine so we want to decrease it by one more thousand so then it's now zero it was 10 minus nine minus one so that's what we need to do to bring the liability to zero and again, whatever happens on the liabilities is going to happen on net claims incurred for these claim transactions. So there's the set of transactions for claim number five. Okay. So when you look at them all together, there's a lot of stuff happening 
But when we just take each transaction step by step, that'll be the easiest way to get used to the activity that happens. Don't try to unwind it all as one mass of different ins and outs. Just try to take it step by step. And then some of these queues are just between these three accounts. Whenever there's cash, we're going to have the expense. Whenever we make a change in claim liability, we're going to have an expense. The liabilities go up, expense goes up, liability goes down, expense goes down. Okay. So this is again how the dual entry is going to work. And we keep the balance sheet in balance and 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 so on. Okay. And then using these pairs of accounts, cash and expense, and then liabilities and expense. Um <clears throat> To, to to keep things in balance and then keeping the increases in expenses matching with the increase in liability. So hopefully that's helpful for not just the claims transactions, but for all of the activity. Yeah, so Glenna, that's a, uh, a good, Good example. In these claim ones, there there's always balance sheet income statement, but not in all of the transactions, right? Because we did one, um, <clears throat> like this cat item number three here. We increased cash asset, and we decreased the broker receivable asset. Okay, so in this case, it was between two asset accounts. All right, so that's possible. <clears throat> I could answer any more questions, but I think um, the best thing to do now would be one, you could either go back to the uh, week two uh, questions and try again now that we've got stepped through it today to try to work through some of these on your own, just using the same examples. Don't look at the answers um, to see how to do it. Make an attempt and then you could use the answers to see if you got it right. Um, come back with any specific questions on the office hours on Tuesday. And then we could try to go through it again. If you're really, really comfortable, take a, an attempt, first attempt at the test. And like I said, if you get through it and you don't like your result, you could always reattempt it again. But at least it'll be another way to see how much of this stuff you're actually uh, you're able to retain and, and capture. Okay. Yeah. Is there a question again? Go ahead. So I think that uh, is a good next for for in class example claim. Let me see. I could. What do we have here for you already? Class two T account practice questions. All right, so what I'm going to do is that worksheet I was just working through, I'm going to add it um, as an upload into this week two T account practice questions. Um, it's things that I added to this Excel sheet here. So then you at least have, you know, this working file related to the discussion that, that we just had, okay? As well as, you know, my start of assessment number the the practice questions number three from last week uh, when you make an attempt will it tell you which items went wrong I think for the multiple choice because the system automatically marks them uh, I think the multiple choice 
you see right away. Um, I'm actually not 100% sure how Blackboard Ultra works. Um, the other questions, I have to mark them. So no, yeah, you wouldn't see um, if you got the responses right. But I'll tell you that for the short answer ones, you'll find the responses are somewhere in the workbook or in, in the class presentation. So, um, I mean, you might, after you submit it, be able to go and do some self-checking um, as well. Uh, you know, for the two Excel sheets, which are similar to doing T accounts like we just did here, um, there'll be similar transactions. So maybe after the test, you'll have more time to go through them and do the checks yourself to see if you want to then resubmit or not. And like I said in week one, I don't, I know um, if you're not, people that are comfortable with numbers, you have the leg up, uh, even if you don't know accounting. And if you are familiar with accounting, um, hopefully looking at insurance transactions this way, you're able to quickly relate it to something else you know. But if you don't know either, and it's numbers, don't try, to reduce, try to reduce your anxiety with the numbers and what you don't know, and just think about it as organizing these transactions into these into two buckets. We're just trying to. We have a dollar amount that's provided. Twelve hundred could be any, could be a, could be one dollar, and we're just trying to organize it dual entry, so we need two buckets for each type of transactions, and then you will get used to which two buckets do I need to put this amount in, okay? Because they are similar types of transactions that we'll, we'll see. And again, what we're identifying is when we have binding a policy, what's that gonna do to our income statement? What's that gonna do to our balance sheet? And by breaking down those transactions first into, you know, T accounts, we'll get used to saying, okay, this is increasing my revenue, which increases net income. And then we'll get used to the offset being an increase to the assets. And maybe right now you don't believe me that it will help you get there, going through it um, into these buckets of debits and credits left side right side will help us get there to be able to understand how transactions impact the financial statements and then knowing what happens in the financial statements what's the impact going to be on a loss ratio or a combined ratio okay so that's the end goal and we're taking it down into this first bucket and that's why I'm spending, you know, two or three days on it or two or three weeks on it, because once we build the same foundation for everybody, then we'll be able to go to the next step. So if you're still that stuck on the first step, that's fine. But we'll get there over the next couple of sessions. OK. If you have any specific questions before the office hours, feel free to send me a course message as well, and I'll look at those uh, over this weekend too. Any questions before we wrap up? Oh, let me see, it looks like I got one here. All right, so whenever there's increasing cash, all right. So in this case, we increased cash with the debit and we reduce this uh, with the credit to the broker. So the question is, why do we uh, debit cash when the money comes in? Um, so it's a couple of ways we could think about that. Let's first go to
So cash, so I'll start here to saying if we wanted to, this plus sign means we're going to, this is an increase to an asset. So we're talking about cash as, which is an asset. So it's a debit to increase uh, cash. All right, that's how all, all assets work, is a, a debit to uh, to increase an asset. Um, I don't know, maybe you think if it's a credit, uh, you know, sometimes if you see a bank statement, uh, they would say that the bank credited your account when it increased cash. That's <clears throat> the terms that the banks use is the opposite debits and credits. That, that's actually, um, in the bank size, it's a credit because they owe you that money that they're holding for you. So the fact that the bank says they credited your account, that doesn't mean it's it's not the same as this debit credit. But I, I know that's confusing because when I see the bank statements, for the company where I work, they tell us they credit the account. Well, I know that's a debit because they increase the cash balance. All right, so it's a debit tr accounting transaction for the insurance company whenever there's an increase in, in cash or an increase in, in any type of asset. Okay, So that's probably where that question is coming from, that uh, increase in cash is a debit, regardless of what the bank statement may say. Hello, Professor. Uh, Dichen here again. Mm -hmm. First of all, thank you. Thank you for clarifying because, like, you just pointed it out and Glenna pointed it out. <clears throat> and all this while, for me, debit and credit was how the bank works. Right. Yes. Yeah, but then here, over here, it's completely the opposite. Correct. Well, I mean, I'm today years, today days old knowing this. And then the second thing I really wanted to ask you was um, your, uh, the Excel worksheet, when you share the present, I mean, the materials for today's recordings and then the presentation, will we have access to this Excel work, I mean, the worksheet? When you do the test? No, no. Oh. Just oh, right. Yeah. So, yeah. So this sheet uh, here, I'm actually going to uh, resave it. Uh, class. Because I was hoping that um, from when I go through the sheet, then maybe I'll understand how, like, how and where the figures come out from, especially in terms of the formulas a little more. Yep. Yeah. And, and the formulas when I do them, um, <clears throat> like here, this is just so that you avoid a typo, <laughs> that if you put 12,000 here and you know transaction one has to equal, it has to be the same amount, but if you go and you type in 11,000 by accident, then right now your transaction one is it's out of balance, right? You put a different amount. So if you did, if you link them, then that just saves you uh, less of a chance of a typo. That's all. Right, right, Professor. And I, I'll and I will also know like from where those figures came coming from. It, exactly, that's right. Because right now we have the cross reference one to tell you they're related. But if it's also linked, then you could see that, yeah, it's the same uh, transaction. Correct. Right. So you'll be sharing this sheet, right, Professor? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so I saved it. I'm going to upload it right now. This will help me a little <laughs> to understand, I thought. Absolutely. No, I do this um, every part, part of... Um, the class docs every time. All right, so it's uploading right now. So you'll see that, uh, you'll see that there. Okay, Professor, thank you. You're welcome. All right. So hopefully we made some progress uh, this week. Please work through the sample questions yourself.
I would say give the test a try. One, to make sure what you, you have access to the Blackboard test. Um, you could download the Excel from the test, complete it, and then re-upload it to make sure that that functionally works. <clears throat> um, and like I said, submit the test. And then you have a whole week and a couple of days to retake it. All right. Um, so we'll, we'll end it there. If there's, uh, I'll stay on a few more minutes if there's any other questions. Um, but that's for sure everything that I wanted to cover uh, for this week. And there are some good questions uh, that we had this week as well. So thank you for those. All right, so I will stick around for a, a few minutes. I'll stop the recording now, though.